In the last two lectures, we have tried to define the novel form and to distinguish it from other kinds of writing. We've also tried to account for what I was calling the Englishness of the English novel. And we looked with some uh, particular attention uh, at a couple of passages, one from Balzac, the French author, one from Dickens, the English author, um, noting uh, the use of uh, sort of comedic endings and the reinforcement of what we might call comedic attitudes. Um, I did want to suggest before moving uh, forward into the next lecture that English fiction tends finally to be reassuring if not comforting. We'll see that when we look at the work of Samuel Richardson, the main subject of this lecture. Um, this world is a good world. Uh, it's one that will provide for us if we work hard and live right. Now, in this lecture, in addition to paying particular attention to Richardson, we're going to place the earliest English novels into a wider historical context. Let's begin by observing that the English novel emerges in the middle of the 18th century, a period of convulsive social change. Now, historians and literary scholars almost always identify their periods as periods of convulsive change. No one ever says, eh, I work on a period when nothing much happened. In this case, though, it's really, really true. Because it's in this period, through the 18th century, that England is developing the world's first capitalist economy. To be sure, there had been various ways of, of trading goods and services. There had been various forms of exchange. But the system that we now call capitalism doesn't really exist before this period, and it doesn't really exist anywhere besides England. Because England is uh, transforming its economy, it also begins to grapple with issues of urbanization, industrialization, and globalization. To understand these massive change, uh, changes and assess their impact on our novels, we must first review the emergence of new economic structures and social values. This review will take us from the country to the city and then out into the rest of the world. Let's start then in the country. In the country, the rural economy is becoming more and more centralized. Common lands, that is, lands that have been available to almost anyone. You need a place to pasture your sheep, you can use this field. You need a place to plant a few crops, tend a little garden, you can use this field. Those common lands have been enclosed or appropriated by the wealthiest families, by the aristocracy and the gentry, in other words. And as a result, subsistence farming and self-sufficient living, what they used to call living off the land back in the 1960s, these were no longer options for rural English men and women. And in thinking about the way that their options were narrowed and their choices were limited in this period, um, we have an opportunity to consider one characteristic feature of a capitalist economy and society, which, according to some economic historians, is that it offers most people little choice but to work for wages. In the city, turning our attention to urban life, in the city, partly because things are changing in the country, populations are rising dramatically. By 1750, the population of London has reached 750,000 people. Now, that may not sound like a particularly large number to us, but at the time, London was the largest city anywhere in the world. It was twice as large as Paris, for example. It was the first real modern metropolis. And so later, in our course when we see writers like Fielding or Dickens talking about urban life, talking about London, um, we need to understand that their 
um, viewing London uh, as something unique and unprecedented. It's not just another big city. It's not just another nice place to visit. It's a historical phenomenon. In the 1780s and 90s, as textile producers opened larger factories, the population of other cities, industrial cities, like Manchester and Birmingham, it explodes. And through all of this, England experiences an early form of what we would now call globalization. The growth of England's first modern industry, textiles, depends on international trade. And if you think about how the textile industry works, you can see what I mean. You can't grow cotton in England. You can't grow cotton in Scotland or in Ireland. It has to be imported from other parts of the world. It has to be brought to the British Isles from the West Indies and eventually from the American South. Now, once it gets to England, it can be processed and then eventually shipped back out again in the forms of cloth and other goods. Taken together, all of these economic and social developments have an enormous impact on the English national imagination. Through much of their history, the English had liked to imagine their society as one dominated by communal values. And here we're talking not about a social reality or a historical reality. We're talking about a national self-image, a national self-understanding. And important to this image, especially important to this image, I have to say that, was a sense of communal solidarity and mutual obligation. To be sure, English society was hierarchical, with clear divisions between rich and poor. But there was this image of a world in which, a society in which, those at the top were able and willing to accept responsibility for the welfare of those at or near the bottom. That was how the English had imagined themselves for many, many years, maybe even for centuries. And with the emergence of a new social order, this traditional self-image, this kind of English mythology, would prove very, very difficult to maintain. Let me give you a couple of uh, reasons why that's so. First, Rural landlords are often accused of placing their own interests ahead of those of their tenants, that is, the people who rent land from them, not least because of the highly controversial enclosure of common lands. Now, the situation in London and the other cities was even more chaotic. Newcomers to the city might arrive with no idea of where they would be living or working. Clearly, no one's looking out for them. No one's providing for their welfare. These sweeping changes raise questions of personal identity. Who am I? Where do I fit? Social responsibility. How am I related to other people? What obligations do I have to them? And moral values. What's the right way to live? What's the right thing to do? Let me just flesh out those questions for you in somewhat greater detail. Question one. In a society where economic self-interest is an increasingly important motivation for personal behavior, making money, maximizing profit, engaging in economic competition, in that sort of society, what kind of behavior is considered worthy and admirable? Question two. At a time of increasing class conflict, increasing tension between rich and poor, there's a rising middle class, a growing middle class. How do they fit into all of this? At that time, what happens to traditional images and mythologies of social cohesion and shared responsibility? Finally, question three. As traditional moral authorities appear less and less reliable, how can individuals develop a sense of right and wrong? Which values should be upheld and why? Now, such questions reverberate through the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. They really extend into the 21st century. These are the questions that we're still grappling with today. And they are the questions that will shape all of the novels in our course. Their presence can certainly be felt in Samuel Richardson's Pamela, 
from 1740, a work often described as the very first English novel. Now, before I go on to say anything about Pamela, to talk about the work in detail, let me just say a little bit about this designation of Pamela uh, as the first English novel. I said that Pamela is frequently described as the first English novel because there has been some disagreement on this point. There are critics and scholars who would point, for example, to the work of Daniel Defoe. He's the author of Robinson Crusoe, most famously, but also of Maul Flanders. And some of those critics and scholars would say, well, you know, aren't these novels, don't they qualify? And there are other scholars who would go back even further pointing to, and, and leave England entirely, actually, pointing to the work of Cervantes, to Don Quixote, and identifying it as the first novel. In spite of this controversy, um, it is fair to say that most people would agree that Richardson's Pamela is a novel. In other words, Pamela is the first work in the tradition that everyone agrees to identify as a novel. And we can understand why people have reached this agreement, why Richardson's novel has earned this distinction, by contrasting Pamela with Eliza Haywood's Love in Excess, uh, the amatory tale we considered in an earlier lecture. There are lots of connections between the two works. Many of the same themes and situations appear, and yet there are also many differences, of which two seem especially important. First. Haywood's characters are types. After a while, it's hard to tell her dashing noblemen and distressed ladies apart. They all sound alike. They're not distinguished in speech or action. Richardson's characters are much more distinctive, in part because they're more complex. Their feelings and desires are often in conflict. Because Richardson's characters are presented and developed in different ways, our relationship to them is also very different. And I want to emphasize this point especially. Novelists, writers, encourage us to relate to their characters, to think about their characters in different ways. And those relationships are an important part of our literary experience, and they're an important part of the works themselves. So as you're reading one of the works for this course, or as you're reading a, a novel on the airplane, think about what kinds of questions you're encouraged to ask, what kinds of investment you're encouraged to make uh, about and in these characters. Thinking about those questions uh, in terms of Haywood's love and excess, in terms of the amatory tale, in other words, uh, there really is only one question. What are the characters going to do? When will they get together? They want it. We want it. When and how is it going to happen? It begins and ends there. In Richardson, our questions go much, much further. For in addition to wondering what the characters will do, we share in their feelings and participate in their emotional and moral development. Richardson's work is not a complete departure from the tradition of the amatory tale, but it is a significant elaboration of that tradition, one that paves the way for later generations of writers. Okay. With all of that in mind, I think we're ready to start talking about Pamela itself. In Pamela, Richardson pits an innocent servant girl against her domineering and sometimes abusive master. At the beginning of the story, Pamela is only 15 years old. She's only 15 years old. She has worked for several years in the service of a wealthy woman, and her talents and intelligence have not gone unnoticed. As a matter of fact, she's kind of been promoted from among the ranks of the servants um, to become a kind of lady-in-waiting to the lady of the house. She's given an opportunity to educate herself. She's given an opportunity to acquire certain kinds of accomplishments, to develop certain kinds of talents. So she has a kind of liminal status. She's in a kind of in-between position, not really part of the family, not really, but not exactly one of the servants either. She's sort of caught between upstairs and downstairs, if you will. <laughs> 
In the very first page of the novel, we learn that Pamela's lady has just died. And so her whole situation, her whole life is completely upset. And there is real reason to doubt uh, that she can remain safe and secure. There's a great deal of confusion about what's going to happen next. Complicating the situation is the fact that her parents are in financial trouble. So the idea of simply returning home to live with them is unappealing to her. She does not want to be a burden on her family. Further complicating Pamela's situation is the presence of her lady's son, who's identified as Mr. B. And he's the basis, I sometimes think, for the Mr. Big character in Sex in the City. There are some sort of connections between these two figures. In any case, Mr. B soon makes it clear that he would like Pamela to become his mistress. And Pamela is attracted to Mr. B, but she refuses to give in to him. And even after she's offered a handsome financial settlement, he really offers to treat her very well. She insists on maintaining her virtue. She refuses to acknowledge her love for him. She certainly refuses to have any kind of physical relationship with him. She insists on maintaining her own purity. And this insistence does not always make her popular, I have to tell you, with modern college students. It's not that they have entirely different views of these matters. It's just that her insistence on purity, virtue, virginity is off-putting. And it's worth noting that it was considered off-putting by many critics and readers at the time. There were lots of parodies and spoofs of Pamela published through the 1740s and 1750s in which this aspect of her character was ridiculed. Anyway, as Richardson fleshes out this basic situation, he creates an explosive image of class conflict. And this is another very, very important point. Um, because in addition to the sort of conflicts between men and women that we've seen in the amatory tales, Richardson introduces this new element of tension uh, across class lines. Let me explain how this works. Though a servant, Pamela really represents the rising middle class. She's drawn to her master. She wants to participate in his world. She wants to be with him. But she no longer really trusts him. And in her attitude toward Mr. B, I think we can see, you know, a sort of typical middle class view of the aristocracy. It's a very attractive group of people. It's a very interesting group of people. But there's a way in which they're not entirely reliable. There's a way in which they're not entirely trustworthy. Now, at times, as she explores these feelings, Pamela appears morally admirable, and at other times, merely self-righteous. So that's Pamela. Mr. B, for his part, stands in for the ruling classes. He is grasping. He is possessive. He wants to own Pamela in the way that he might own any other piece of property. And he's also impatient and explosive. At several points in the book, he tells her that she's going to have to cut him some slack. She's going to have to give him a break because he was spoiled as a child. All rich boys are spoiled, he tells her, and he hasn't learned the kind of self-control and self-command that, you know, middle-class people or even working-class people are supposed to uh, maintain and observe. Nevertheless, in spite of these character flaws, there's a sense in which Mr. B, and I think this is present from the very beginning of the novel, there's a sense in which Mr. B may prove capable of reform. There are clearly good qualities in this fellow. There are queer, clearly real virtues in this fellow. And so it's a question of whether or not those virtues can be brought out and made the basis for his behavior, made the basis for his character. So we've got here uh, a very interesting sort of class conflict. And this conflict, as I've already suggested, proved irresistible to Richardson's audience, igniting debates throughout the entire country. Now, 
Let's just pursue this issue uh, in a little more detail by turning to an example, a passage from the novel. In this passage, Pamela's frustrations with Mr. B and his haughty friends and family finally get the better of her. Writing in her journal, and one of the most famous things about this book, by the way, is the fact that the story is told almost entirely through Pamela's own letters and journal entries. It's an epistolary novel, in other words. It's based on letters or epistles. She lets loose, basically, gives us a sense of how she feels about her own position, about her subordination to people who are supposed to be her social betters. Here's the passage. And the syntax here will be a little garbled, I have to say, because she's excited, because she's um, a, a little overwrought even. Anyway, here she goes. How do these gentry know that supposing they could trace back their ancestry for one, two, three, or even 500 years, that then the original stems of these poor families, though they have not kept such elaborate records of their good-for-nothingness as it often proves, were not still deeper rooted. So think about what she's asking there. If you go back a century, two, three, five, how do you know that the families uh, on top currently at the moment would be the families, were the families on top back then? These things change, right? We don't always think about those changes. The people at the top don't like us to think about those changes, but they happen. Then she goes on to make another sort of point. How can they be assured, these great families, that 100 years hence or two, some of those now despised upstart families, the nouveau riche, may not revel in their estates while their descendants may be reduced to the other's dunghills. So what goes around comes around, right? You don't always get to hang on to your current place on the social ladder. And perhaps, this is her closing, such is the vanity as well as changeableness of human estates in their turns set up for pride of family and despise the others. So there's a nice little reflection at the end, right? As soon as you get to the top of the social ladder, you forget how you got there, you start to act as if you had been there all along, your family had been there all along. Now, in this passage, I think we see Pamela at her best. We see her as smart, we see her as feisty, we see her even as a little saucy. And it's this side of Pamela that proved irresistible, I think, to Richardson's audience. And this quality in Pamela that really distinguished her from the heroines of the romances and the amatory tales. The ending of the novel suggests that Richardson was hoping not merely to reflect social changes, but also to influence them. The ending is comedic, as I hope we've come to expect, and as Pamela demonstrates her worth and value to Mr. B, we begin to see that social assimilation and reconciliation are not only possible, but desirable for all parties. In short, Pamela marries Mr. B, she becomes the lady of the house in which she once served as a servant. Now, Pamela benefits from the marriage in obvious ways. Social advancement, material satisfaction and comfort. All of that is obvious, and many of the lampoons and satires of Richardson's work pointed to these benefits as her real motives, saying that, suggesting that all Pamela ever really wanted was to marry into the upper class. The important thing for us to note is that Mr. B benefits from the marriage as well. This is one of Richardson's main points, because Mr. B gets, in this bargain, an opportunity or a chance to fulfill his social obligations. Inspired by Pamela's goodness, he may finally live up to his duty as lord and master. And so, 
Although Richardson, throughout the course of the book, often protests against the abuses of the ruling class, as I think he does in that passage we were looking at a moment ago, he eventually reaffirms the traditional values of communal solidarity and mutual respect. Notice what I'm saying here. In the end, he wants to convince his middle-class audience, his middle-class readers, to hope and perhaps even to work for the rehabilitation of older traditional social structures. Like most of the novelists we will study, he is a reformer, not a revolutionary or a radical. I, I want to make this point one last time, because I think that it's enormously important. And maybe in this way, I can bring some of the disparate materials from this lecture together. Richardson is writing at a time when traditional English self-images based on communal solidarity, one for all and all for one, when those self-images are increasingly threatened by new economic developments, new social orders, and new social values. And so what does he do? He creates a work in which those stresses and strains and tensions are acknowledged and dramatized in the conflict, the bantering that goes on between Pamela and Mr. B. All of that is acknowledged. But at the end, that is set aside, and the old self-image is reaffirmed. It's as if he's telling his English readers, you know, we've always thought that our society could be ordered and organized in ways that would benefit everyone, and we don't have to stop thinking in that way. We can continue to imagine ourselves in those terms. We can continue to hope for and, you know, even predict those outcomes. Very, very important sort of combination of um, progressive and modern attitudes on the one hand, traditional and conservative attitudes on the other. And I think it's fair to say that that combination of sort of progressive views and conservative views, particularly as expressed in the comedic ending, that combination will be characteristic of much of the fiction we read. There will be along the way, you'll see this in Austen, you'll see it again in Dickens, you'll see it again in George Eliot, you know, sometimes scathing social critique. But at the end, a kind of reaffirmation of traditional, maybe even conventional social values. All right. In our next lecture, we're going to continue our study of Richardson. We'll take a look at his own life history, which is fascinating, and we will look to see how he can be compared and contrasted with his main rival in the period, Henry Fielding. Fielding is the author of two important novels, Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones. Tom Jones is considered his masterpiece, as you probably know. And in these works, he seems to present uh, a sharp contrast to Richardson. And in our lecture, we will look at some of the differences between the two writers. We will see why they were regarded in the period and why they continue to be regarded as sometimes bitter rivals. But we'll also look for connections and points of similarity. We'll also look for some of the ways in which these two books taken together can herald the arrival of a new literary form. Many people sort of view or present uh, Richardson and Fielding as the parents of the new form, suggesting that somehow the new form grows out of a tension between works like Pamela and works like Tom Jones. And this next lecture will help us to see why they say so.